What's up, everybody? This is Coos with Coos's Corner. I'm here with special guest Sam the Man from the Mountaineer Effect. How you doing, Sam? Good, man. What's going on, everybody? You doing all right, man? Doing great. I appreciate you coming on. Thanks for having me, buddy. Yeah, man. Why don't you go ahead and tell everybody where they can find you real quick? Uh, on uh, YouTube, um, the Mountaineer Effect, um, uh, and then on Facebook at uh, Geek Girl TV, uh, mainly on YouTube. I'm yeah. Uh, okay, and you uh, you talk, uh, I'm assuming you do college football? Do a little college football. I have a lot of guests on. Do I'm getting kind of starting to get into college basketball. I'm actually more more into college basketball, really, than football even. Um, but uh, a little bit of everything. You know, I like to talk sports in general. We bring on guys that talk hockey and just a little bit of everything from time, you know, just kind of whatever flavor we, we have going at the time. <laughs> cool. Well, every, all right. Well, I, any of my viewers who are not familiar with Sam, go check him out on the Mountaineer Effect. I'll put a link in the description box for his channel. What I, what I find intriguing about this game, both teams rely on their defense very heavily. Minnesota's offense did not, has not done well either the last couple seasons, ever since they lost their, uh, their Kirk Shiraka, who was their offensive coordinator back in 19, who ironically is at West Virginia now as an analyst. And I just saw reports when I was researching for this video, they're trying to hire him back. Hmm. So what if he goes, but what if he gets hired before this game? Does well, he take I'll trade take, secrets with him? Well, and you know, they, you know, they do. And you know, that that's something that, you know, that's a, maybe a different podcast, but you know, this coaching carousel that that's been going on for the last little bit, I really think the NCAA needs to step up and, and, and make it, make a rule that coaches can't just up and leave mid mid season. At least wait till the ball games are over. Let it start after that. Give the kids their season. Give the kids their ball games, and then if you want to move on, have at it. But I, I really think that it cheapens uh, college football just a little bit when you have guys flying all over the place, moving all over the place, taking trade secrets with them because you know it does happen. Um, I think that's something that really needs to be addressed. I don't know how there's not some sort of a you know, violation going on there with all that. But, you know, it's like Lincoln Riley. You know, there's no doubt that he was talking to USC, you know, for God knows how long, you know, it just right. – it's just – I have no problem with them leaving, but it's just the way they do it. I, I just think I it's completely unprofessional. Well, the way – like I said, I, I know it's probably a different video, but the way they – this early signing day is what's caused all this which I was all for that at first, but now that I've seen the, the ramifications of it, and I, I even heard Lincoln Riley the other day in an interview say he don't like it anymore. He don't think he don't like it either. He said, I don't like the way this is all happening. But unfortunately, that early signing, you know, he, he's got to start recruiting for USC yeah. ASAP, so that means they've got to hire him ASAP. And that's just using him as an example. But like you said, it's just a whole – So I, I think they may go back and – I think they may go back to the rules committee or whoever sets these rules may go back and look at this and think, say maybe this early signing day is not the best idea, you know, and, and maybe change it. I think they, it wouldn't hurt my feelings if they did. I, uh, I agree with you a thousand percent. Uh, but anyway, uh, but that being said, I would like this guy, if you look their offense when he under him two years ago was 21st in the nation with this same quarterback. Mm -hmm. And if he comes back, that, that that makes me kind of wish West Virginia would hire him as their offensive coordinator. To be perfectly honest with you, yeah, I mean, they re West Virginia really needs an offensive coordinator. They need somebody. I know they have one. It depends on how you really want to define offensive coordinator, but to get somebody that's a legit offensive coordinator that is totally focused on the offense, I think he'd be a really good fit. I think it's something that they need to look at and really address it before the bowl game if possible. Yeah, and somebody that calls plays. That's when I when I hear offensive coordinator, I think of somebody that's actually calling the offensive plays. Yeah. I mean, Jared Parker's got it by time. And I know he has input on the play calling and and, and does, does does some of the play calling, but Neil Brown, my understanding, is the actually the guy ultimately calling the plays. And if he would delegate that over completely to a full time play calling offensive coordinator, like a Sharaka, if that guy I mean that guy apparently is really good, uh, then I would like it. I mean, I'm all for that, honestly. I'm not a huge fan of 
the coaches who call their own plays. I just don't think it. There's too much going on in the middle of a game. Time management, substitutions, all of that, timeouts, all of that stuff that he has to worry about. He doesn't need to be worrying about calling what are, what plays we got to call next. I, I just – I'm not a huge fan of it, not at that level anyway. I, I just think there's too much at stake. Uh, you know, he's got media crap he's got to deal with during the week. How much time does he actually have to sit down and prepare and put together a play sheet, a play calling sheet for that game, you know? Uh, that's that's where I what the way I look at it. Well, and I agree with that. You know, um, something else that it also gives a, a head coach is somebody to point the finger at when things aren't going the way it's supposed to go. And you know, Lincoln Riley's a good example. He calls his own plays. Neil Brown calls his own. You know, a lot of his own plays. Mm-hmm. When things aren't working, you don't have anybody to point your finger at. And sometimes in college football, you need somebody to point your finger at. And yep, you know, I agree with it. All the great coaches, they have people around them to point the finger at if something's not going right. And that's just, you know, that's just the nature of the beast. I'm I'm glad. I was really happy that, that they made a bowl game. Like, you know, for for the fans, for the kids, for us guys doing podcasts, you know, West Virginia, you can talk to it. And I, I, I know Kuz will agree with me. Do, talking about West Virginia football this year was not easy. Like, okay. it wasn't. Like, we picked the wrong time to start doing this because, like, it was a – it was a hard year to sit and talk about West Virginia football because one minute they look great and the next minute they look terrible. And, you know, the teams that they're playing are up and down and all around and you don't know week to week what you're getting from one team to the next. I mean, the big 12 is just so unpredictable. Like, you know, I think, I think, you know, I watched your channel. You've done a great job this year, keeping up on everything with all the chaos that's been going on with it all. West Virginia just, is a is a hard team to follow um, right now, but I have a feeling, man. I have a feeling our 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 um, podcasting fun is is just now getting ready to start. I think going into next year, man, we're gonna have a whole lot of fun with it. <laughs> I agree, man. I agree. It's uh, it's gonna be a lot of fun to see follow this team through the off season, see how the green class goes. Uh, you know, to see what. Uh, I'm already thinking thinking ahead about the spring. You know, what's the spring going to look like when we get Nico in here? You know, because he's supposed to early enroll. I can't wait. I'm. This is the only time I typically don't pay a whole lot of attention as a fan to the spring game. Obviously, I probably will now because I do this. And then also with Nico coming in, I can't wait to see that kid spin a football. And, and I'm, oh, I would love to hopefully make it up there to see that. I don't know if I will or not, mm-hmm. but uh, – I'm just really excited about next season. And I know I say that. I I know I say that every year because I'm a fan, but uh, I I really am because I do think the climb, even though that's everybody's tired of hearing it, I do think it's working. It's just going slower than we wanted it to. And I think uh, Nico coming in is going to be a huge piece of that. Um, I'm not saying he's going to come in and start right away. So don't, I'm I'm not, I'm not going that far with it, but I do think he's the future of the program. Uh, It might not be 2022, but it might be 2023 and beyond 2024. Well, the, the one thing that I, I'll say about Nico just kind of in a nutshell is he is a natural leader. You can just listen to him talk and you can tell. And West Virginia sorely misses leaders on the field, off the field. I think he's going to fill a role, whether he plays a snap or not, he's going to fill a role that we have, we haven't been able to feel any other way. And I think filling that leadership role and that um, ability to motivate your guys and to hold them accountable, like just having that piece on the team is going to make this team better. And that's what excites me the most about Nico is it's going to be those little unseen, unsaid things that he's going to do that he naturally does already that's really going to help transform this team, whether he plays or not. I agree. I agree with that. I'm Like I said, I'm excited and – uh you mentioned the ACC earlier. This is totally off on a tangent, but I wanted to ask your opinion. Uh, I know you and I both watch Golden Blue, dude, and he's adamant that West Virginia's going to the ACC. He just doesn't know when. I saw a report, I think it was a couple of days ago, it's kind of an off-the-radar thing, that the ACC network just re-upped again and for like $200 million or some odd crazy amount of money. Uh, that the ACC re-upped with the ACC network. Everything I had been hearing up until now, the ACC network was bleeding money. Mm-hmm. 
something has got what's changed that has made the ACC network want to increase the payout to the ACC. There's got to be something changed. Uh, maybe there's maybe there is maybe what I'm getting at is maybe there is something behind the scenes that going on that we don't know about. Well, and, and it's hard to speculate on another man's, uh, you know, sources. <laughs> I understand. You know, but going off of what you just said, and and here's how you need to. Here's how I look at that because I heard the same thing you did about the the re up and the money. Mm-hmm. Okay, they didn't up it for West Virginia. Okay, they upped it. I think this is just my opinion. I think they upped it. As a, as a potential fishing lure for Notre Dame. Okay. And the reason is, the reason I think that is, is because the ACC championship, as great as it was between Pittsburgh and Wake Forest, it would have been, it, uh, you would have Notre Dame in the conference championship. Notre Dame as a conference champion, do they get in over Michigan? Do they get in over Cincinnati? Instead, they're not, they're completely left out of the conversation. Like right. literally, Michigan would have had to have lost for them to even Oklahoma State had to lose and Michigan had to lose for them to even be in the same conversation of potentially getting in. Mm-hmm. But if they had that conference champion banner around their head, they'd look at them a little bit differently. So I have a feeling like, but I think West Virginia is going to benefit from, from it too. I, I'm not saying it's totally for Notre Dame, but I think, I think the plan for the ACC is to try to pull them both in at the same time. That would make the most sense. Um, I agree with that. And, and I think that maybe that might be the, the thing. Cause you go to Notre Dame right now with the coaching change and the way that was all handled and this new coaching staff, and you tell them, say, you know, if you'd have played for, an, for a conference championship, you might have actually got a bid to the national championship. And I think you're going to start seeing that, you know, if it continues them being independent, that's that's just what it's going to be. Yeah. They're just going to, you know, one loss and you're not going to, you're not going to get in. They'll eventually have to do something. They won't have a choice. Unless unless the college football playoff expands to 12, then it won't matter anymore. As then all they got to do is finish in the top 12 and they'll be fine. Well, and, and I'm still holding out that, old Gordon Gee uh, is going to be the monkey wrench in that one because yep. I don't think he's going to, I don't think he's ever going to move off the position of not expansion and not expanding until West Virginia is in a stable conference. You know, that's, th- that's the, that's the thing with the big 12. Like you might be adding, you know, Houston and BYU and, and, and Cincinnati, some really good pieces, but honestly you take Texas and Oklahoma out, of the equation and the money that goes with them. I mean, it's just a beefed up big East, really. I mean, that's the way I see it. Like it's, it's no bit better than the big East really was. And, and the reason I say that is because any team can beat anybody at any time. There are no top dogs in the conference. Um, and I think that is just unstable, completely unstable. And I think West Virginia wants to be somewhere stable where, you know, if we have a six and six year and we get a bowl game, it's going to maybe be somewhere that me and you can hop in the car and go sit, go watch it. Exactly. You know, and, and I think it would be better for the fans, better for the players, all this money West Virginia spends traveling halfway across the country every other week. Like, you know, it, it's a lot, it's a lot of money and, and it just doesn't benefit West Virginia enough to stay in the big 12. I don't think. And there are multiple ACC stadiums that are closer for you and I to go to than Morgantown. Yeah, I mean, Think about from it. Blacksburg for perfect is a perfect example. One hour away, you yep. got. I mean, heck, uh, NC State's three and a half hours away. Yep, UNC, uh, Duke, Duke, UNC, uh, Ch- uh, Charlottesville. Yep. I mean, you're talking within three hours. We hop in the car within three hours. We can be to half the ACC uh, stadiums. Yep. I mean, it's it's really you know that's the direct that's why I think Golden Blue Dude's right is because you know when you really look at all these things and the way they're layered, it makes the most it just makes the most sense. I mean, it does, yep. and uh, you know, West Virginia and the ACC. You know, I don't care what anybody says; they might disagree with us. I know you'll agree with this. West Virginia's logo and their brand is one of the best, if not the best, I think, in the country. 
That flying WV, I don't care if you're in California or West Virginia, when you see it, you know what it is, you know who it is, you know what it's for. And just bringing that branding into the ACC is is good for the, the conference from top to bottom because we're going to travel. You know, nobody's going to UNC to watch UNC and Duke and UNC and Wake Forest. Like, like they're, they're not selling out. Pittsburgh was great this year, one of the funnest teams to watch in the country. They couldn't sell out a game. But – you throw that WV in there where, you know, we're playing at their home stadium every other year. All of a sudden, all us West Virginia folk are traveling down there to those games and you're going to, you're going to see an increase in revenue. It's just, it's just the way it works. Absolutely. I agree. 100%. The only thing that, that I think might determine is that $80 million buyout. That's the only thing that concerns me. Uh, I'm sure Gordon Gee's got something up his sleeve to get that negotiated down. Well, and not only that, but we also have to remember Jim Justice, the great, depending on how you want to look at it, great, terrible governor of West Virginia, is a billionaire. And he's said on several occasions, if they need any help from him making headway with anything, all they have to do is get him on the phone. I have a feeling that if push came to shove, West Virginia, uh, if not him personally, West Virginia would take a vested stake in getting West Virginia into a more favorable uh, conference. I really do believe that. And did you see the uh, report that Joe Manchin made a statement not long ago, or he didn't make the statement that came out about him, uh, that he had a conversation with Gordon Gee and asked Gordon Gee if he needed to get involved. And Gordon Gee said, no, it's not necessary. Yeah. I so mean, I, I, I think there's something, I think there's something going on. It just hasn't, they just can't say it yet. I agree because you know, that's the thing. Like West Virginia is so different than all these other states when it comes to our football. You know, all we have is West Virginia and Marshall, and you know, Marshall's out on on the wing out there. You know, and people kind of overlook Marshall, but West Virginia football is what we have, and that's it. And everybody's involved, like, and that includes our politicians, our governors, our senators, everybody. Like they, all they want to do is see the furtherment of that program. And when you have that much support, you know, good things are bound to happen at some point. And I think all those things combined with Neil Brown and the climb and the recruiting class that we've got coming in. I mean, man, like how are we not setting ourselves up for something great? Like, I mean, the writing's on the walls. It, it really is. I really do believe that. Like the, the, it's all coming together and, and it didn't come together as quick as we wanted it. You know, maybe it would have been a little better if we hadn't had, co you know, all this COVID mess last year. And then you're still dealing with COVID somewhat this year. I mean, it, we're getting there. Um, and as much as I cringe every time I, I hear trust the climb, the hardest part of any kind of hike or climb, man, is right at the end, right when you're getting, mm -hmm. right when you're getting to the top and it sucks. Like it sucks when you get there and it's hard and, um, it's tiring and it's emotional. And, but once you get to that top, man, like, and that we're there, I think we're there. Just, I think so. And people want to look at, you can't look at just record either. You know, you look at the six and six record last year, we were six and four. Cause you know, we missed a couple of games because of COVID, but so the win total may not be the same, be any better, but you look at how we lost the games and when we were, there was two, there's three or four games there that we could have won. One less mistake, one more possession. You know, we're like we're a three and four, three or four loss football team. Well, I mean, the truth of it is, is we're four, 15 points from being ten and two. Exactly. I mean, like that. That's what that's what Mountaineer Nation's got to focus on. You and you can go look at it. Go look at the scores. You were legitimately 15 points from being ten and two. If yeah. we'd have finished ten and two this year, man, we'd have been turning black backflips in the yard. You know, what I mean, Look I mean, good. that's the truth. But it's just the kid the 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 coaching is still Neil Brown's still learning some things about winning ball games, coaching to win. He's for he's our age, man. Like I don't yeah, I, I'm sure he's got some lessons to learn. But then you take these kids that he's pulled in from the portal and he's kind of put together this Frankenstein of a team. They're gonna. It's gonna take them a little bit of time to learn how to win close games. That's that's the hard part. Anybody can win a blowout. It's winning those really close games that that it really takes a seasoned team 
or a team that's confident to do. And we just we just quite don't have that confidence yet. And but it's coming. It's coming. Right. I agree. Yeah, he he said it multiple times, you know, you know, that they were uh they were gonna have a lot of close ball games this year. He I think he saw a lot of this coming. I mean he, he knew that they weren't gonna be blowing anybody out because he, they're not there yet. He knew that they were gonna have to grind games out because that's how they were gonna have to play and he probably strategized and called plays around that same mindset uh, because he he's, knew his personnel. He's too good of a talker. That's part of the problem. Neil Brown, you know, it's so funny when you compare Neil with, you know, Rich Rod and Dana and uh, Bill Stewart, Don Neyland, and just he's such a good talker. Like, it's it's it almost annoys you because he's so good at answering questions. Like, and he, he makes you feel he, he instills some confidence. He did in me. I mean, that was why, you know, my prediction I think was eight and four for the year, mm-hmm. which, you know, wasn't, wasn't too far off, but just listening to him talk, you know, he got two extra victories out of my mentality, you know, like, yep. so it's like, mm-hmm. he, he's really good at, at, at making you believe that th- this team is is going to be better than what they are. And that's not a bad quality to have because eventually when the kids start seeing that they're better than what everybody else thinks they are, that's when you start winning close ball games. It's instilling some some confidence. And, you know, what's a coach going to do? Come out and say, well, we're not that good this year. That's just not the way it works. No. Um and with some of the kids he's got coming in, you know, and I know we keep going back to Nico, but there are others. Some of those kids that are coming in, I mean, that's going to rub off and they're going to, you know, expect bigger things out of themselves. And that's when the magic happens. I appreciate you hopping on here. Everybody, please go check out Sam the Man on his channel, uh, The Mountaineer Effect. And uh, he's got some great content out there. He and I are both after that 1,000 subscribers. Uh, go If you haven't yet, go to subscribe to his channel. If you haven't subscribed to this channel yet, please do so. Hit the thumbs up button for us. Click that. Yeah. Click that click, subscribe. Yeah. Boop it. As one guy on YouTube I watch, <laughs> boop, boop, boop that like button. <laughs> and uh, it really, both of the, all those things help us out. But listen, uh, everybody, appreciate you tuning in. Have a good day. Until next time. And let's go Mountaineers. Horns down always. <laughs> <laughs>